Good evening, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, my name uh, is Gavin Cleesby. I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, and this is our seventh meeting of the MHS Film Club. Uh, just in case anyone is joining us for um, joining our film club for the first time, uh, it's worth mentioning that the idea is very similar to a book club. Uh, we pick a movie every month, uh, ask people to watch it on their own, and then we get together to have a discussion. So this evening we'll discuss uh, the 1977 uh, film Between the Lines with Ned Hinkle and Ivy Moylan of the Bridal Film Foundation uh, in Cambridge. Uh, as I'm sure uh, many of you know, the Massachusetts Historical Society hosts a variety of public programs, seminars, and teacher workshops throughout the course of the year. We offer many of these programs for free or for a very modest cost, uh, but we're only able to do this thanks to the support of our members and donors. If you enjoy our film club, we hope you'll also consider becoming a supporter of MHS. So now, without further ado, I'm happy to uh, turn it over to Ned and Ivy, who are gonna tell us about Between the Lines. Hello. Hi. <laughs> uh, here we are, okay. So I did not print our notes earlier, so I'm going to refer to them now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Ivy, this is Ned. Uh, we run the Brattle Theater, actually the Brattle Film Foundation, which is the nonprofit that runs the Brattle Theater in Harvard Square. Um, hopefully some of you are familiar with that. And we're excited to talk to you today about the film Between the Lines. Um, we have some stuff prepared, um, but I, you know, I like to start just by asking people their basic feedback. Um, I used to teach film classes at the Cambridge Center for Adult Education, and it always felt like it was best to just get the likes and dislikes out of the out of the way, because we all have a feeling about a film, if you were able to watch the film in advance. Um, did anyone have a strong response to this film and want to share it before we jump it, Ned and I jump into more like background and what we saw and things like that? You can raise your hand or unmute yourself. And if you don't, that's fine. So uh, I would say that um, I had, both alike and there was also parts that were a little bit uncomfortable um and um i love the old scenes of boston and cambridge yeah uh and just sort of being able to see harvard square when out of town news was still out of town news and the uh the head house was still the head house um and so just like seeing old images of like the boston that i remembered as a kid uh was fantastic um and uh there were also certain points like the very beginning where you have this sort of like very glorious depiction of uh, the uh, Prudential building um, was just very neat to see like the Prudential building has this like space age crazy new thing and now it doesn't look that way at all. Um, then uh, I was also struck however by how um, the gender politics in offices was off-putting. <laughs> <laughs> like, and so it was a little like, ooh, yuck, that's kind of gross. <laughs> and certainly but the thing a part that's of the cool, time. But a thing that I like about the film, because I totally agree with you, is that it's also addressed. Right. Like the film doesn't, I mean, that stuff's in broadcast news. It's in, you know, it's probably in spotlight if I went back to look at it, but it's it's really conf it's usually confronted. Um or to the point where I feel like the times when it's not confronted, you as the viewer are aware of it. Um, but yeah, I do think, I do think that that the gender politics were very are very forefront in this film, mm -hmm. undeniably. Um, Ned, <laughs> um, do you have any likes or dislikes? Since oh no, I mean, luckily I nobody's frothing at the mouth. Oh, that's fine. Way. That's great. Yeah. I really enjoy the film. Um, we've watched it several times now, uh, or I've watched it several times now because we've screened it at the Brattle and we've um, uh, talked about it on our podcast. Yeah. Early um, in lockdown, um, we actually started talking to Gavin about doing like a Boston on film series back in late 2019. And so at the beginning of lockdown, when we started a podcast just to like have something to feed people um, and keep us all distracted from, you know, impending doom. Uh, we did do a three-part 
section on Boston on film based on the conversations that we'd had with Gavin and MHS previously that um, you can come and find. We talk about between the lines. We also talk about all like the gangster pics and the, you know, the, the Brahmin stuff that's shown yeah. and different things like that. So. And as a bonus, there's actually a fourth episode of that, uh, the sort of Boston movies where we talked to Adam Rothman, who, um, who works behind the scenes on a lot of movies shot in Boston. Mm-hmm. So um, that's, that's a fun bonus too, but that's not why we're here. No. We're here to talk uh, exclusively about between the lines. Um, and I, and I guess we can, um, unless anybody has strong feelings, they want to voice, uh, we can, we can get into just talking a little bit about some background on the film and uh, the people who are in it and the people involved. Uh, for me, the most interesting figure, aside from the cast, which is clearly re- extremely talented and mm-hmm. went on to be very well known in other in other respects, um, I really uh, want to talk a little bit about the director Joan Micklin Silver, um, because it really was unusual at the time for there to be a, a woman director. Period. It was very rare um, in uh, American film. Especially uh, in narrative. Especially so. in, in American narrative film, um, uh, really up until the, the 90s. So uh, Silver was, was really a pioneer, um, and her films are all, share, or not all, but mostly share a, a character of sort of like understated comedy. Um, they're sort of funny in the way that real life is funny. And I think that that's something that's, generally true about Between the Lines. Um, She was born in 1935 in the Midwest. She started her career as a playwright and uh, really as a screenwriter, but she was very well supported by her husband who saw that she wanted to uh, get into filmmaking and uh, uh, saw all the obstacles that were put in her way as a a woman wanting to be a director. Hmm. And so they founded a... um, uh, Midwest Films, a uh, production company on their own. And between with the two of them, they produced a film called Hester Street, which was re- released in 1975. Um, it's a turn of the century New York City story about Russian Jewish immigrants. And, you know, it's, it's fairly uh, unassuming, but it's a really interesting movie. And has an incredible performance by Carol Kane at the center of it. And in fact, it gained her an Oscar nomination, which, you know, Mm. so that's, you know, getting an Oscar nomination for your film at any level is really important to have it be a first time woman director in 1975, uh, who, you know, aided by this great performance um, was able to uh, usher Carol Kane into people's consciousness is Pretty great. And the film itself became sort of an independent hit. I did hear an interview with Carol Kane a couple of years ago, and she still considers that one of her favorite roles. Yeah, it's a it's a great role. So this was her uh, Between the Lines was her second feature length film. Despite the success of Hester Street, she still couldn't get uh, Hollywood Studios to pay any attention to her or give her any money. Which is a pretty Um, standard situation, (laughs) at least until just recently for uh, women directors, that there are a lot of um, male directors in, and you know, gender is becoming even harder to conversate, but like to talk about, but at this point, we know we were dealing with that duality that um, male directors, usually their second film, if they have a breakthrough independent film, their second film, they get this like cash um, uh, to make something bigger. And for female directors, it's usually their third or fourth, if they're lucky to make that many. Yeah. Um, So Silver recalled during a um, interview that she gave in the late seventies, Um, that she was told quite bluntly by Mm -hmm. an executive at a studio that uh, feature films are very expensive to mount and distribute and women directors are one more problem we don't need. So basically she knew that she wasn't (laughs) going to get any support from the studios uh, and they went ahead and funded uh, Between the Lines on their own and found this incredible cast of some people who had been in small roles, some people who had been in larger roles, some people who had acted a lot, some people who hadn't acted very much, but a lot of people who went on to become 
quite well known as leads, you know. Uh, There's a lot of familiar faces in this. Film. Obviously, Jeff Goldblum is probably the biggest star that you see in this movie. And it was really his second large role. He was in uh, Next Stop Greenwich Village. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so he's referred to in the press for this movie as Jeff Goldblum of Next Stop Greenwich Village. Um, <laughs> And uh, of course, John Hurd, this is John Hurd's first role. He went on Hmm. to uh, be in several of her other films. Uh, Lindsay Krauss was in, had been in All the President's Men and was in Slapshot. So she was actually a more experienced actor. She plays Abby in the film. Yes, I felt like she's sort of like one of the actors from that time. Yeah, that you can tell. Uh, Went on to become now the ex Mrs. David Mamet. Um, Jill Eikenberry playing mm-hmm. the receptionist. This was her debut. Uh, you will recognize her from L.A. Law, I believe. Uh, Bruno Kirby, uh, who is a character actor that's been in, you know, dozens and dozens of movies, had been acting a lot um, before this film. Uh, Gwen Wells, who plays Laura the Redhead, um, was a, an actor of note in Nashville, uh, mm-hmm. as Goldblum had also appeared in Nashville. So uh that was the real connection and and the list goes on and on you'll notice a lot of um faces including joe morton who is in um john sales brother from another planet and is continuing to be a working actor today so they were all you know this is a really good cast that they were able to put together and i would credit the success of hester street and the success of carol kane's role in hester street for them being able to cast all these people in the movie um, Silver went on to have, a, you know, a long career. She was directing movies up until the early 2000s. She did a lot of work on TV movies and short films as well as features. Um, her third feature, as Ivy was saying, was actually a studio film, Chilly Scenes of Winter. It was not uh, an easy film to get made because of conflict between her and the producers. Uh, that also had John Hurd in it. She then went on to, she directed Crossing Delancey with Great Amy movie. Irving, uh, Lover Boy. One of my faves. From 1989 with Patrick Dempsey. Um, unfortunately, she passed away uh, at the end of 2020, but um, she was uh, she was quite quite an interesting director. And if you did appreciate, if you do appreciate the tone and kind of the um, sort of like everyday uh, mm. comedy uh, and drama and drama of between the lines. I, I recommend all of her other work um, from television to short films to, to features. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this film was received well by critics outside of Boston <laughs> <laughs> in, in Boston, not so much. Um, let's, let's do a little bit, because yeah. one of the things I thought was really interesting, and I think is one of the reasons why this film is about an alternative newspaper, is because Joan Micklin Silver had worked or was working at the... She had worked at the, the Village, Village Voice. Voice right? and, and I, yeah, I neglected to mention that the screenwriter, uh, Fred Barron, who wrote the script for this he movie... He was local... Yeah, and he had worked at the Phoenix and the Real Paper. Yeah, which I'll, I have a whole thing about alternative rags in Boston. <laughs> um, so but. there was real experience there, and part of the issue that the Boston press took was that they were they had expected to see themselves reflected in this movie, and instead they found uh, a character study, like an ensemble character movie that was a little bit funny. And didn't really... It didn't feel like them. In their minds, it didn't feel like them. Which I think is very strange. I mean, maybe it's because of 30, 40 decades of space between us and 1977. But to me, it feels the opposite. Like, the apartments feel like apartments that people actually live in. And the locations the fact that there there is set locations Mm -hmm. right um but there are locations for those of us who live in the area to be like where are we what are we doing um the office i mean ned and i were used to work at the middle east we've worked at a bunch of independent businesses we work at the brattle now like we know the sort of pastiche of a of a lived-in office space and uh that the office felt real to me, the sort of like the broken coffee machine and the the games and the 
files and of course then all the you know jurassic technology like rolodexes yeah. and things like that that i like seeing i mean one of the things that i i think one can glean from reading the reviews uh at least from the boston press is that they you know people who are in alternative journalism took themselves very seriously right. And the people who are depicted in this film or the aspects of the people who are depicted in the film uh, that are shown that take themselves seriously. Right. Are, are kind of are there the there they are the people who are, um, you know, either self-centered or blocked or not being able to work. So uh, inauthentic, yeah, like inauthentic. or losing their authenticity. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bruce McCabe wrote about it in the Boston Globe. Uh, his review called it, uh, said it, it converts potentially interesting characters into stereotypes and in some cases bores. Uh, he said, this is essentially a slick commercial minded filmmakers look at Boston, not the city we feel about us every day, which I feel like is a very, uh, is probably felt true at the time but but yeah. now it seems to us like a great uh time capsule um you know david denby in the phoenix was a, was a little bit more kind saying he thought it was moderately entertaining um but that it had nothing in it about work and that it's mainly about boyfriend girlfriend problems uh he says what little it says about journalism is mostly wrong um and the worst thing anybody says about this movie at the time, because 1977, you know, a movie is a very serious thing. Uh, Denby says much of Between the Lines plays on the harmlessly ingratiating level of a good television show. Um, so, you know, those were just some of the responses to it. Um, Bruce McCabe went on to write an article later on in which he interviewed people who were attached to the real paper, paper and the Boston Phoenix um, and elicited uh, from Steve Mindich a quote. Who ran the Boston Phoenix. Yes, he ran the Phoenix and later um, bought and ran the real paper and merged it into the Boston Phoenix. But he says, uh, quoting Mindich, it says, it had some nice moments as a film, but I can't understand why it was made. I think one of the problems is that Silver is unfocused directorially. She doesn't make choices. It would have been interesting to see what a director like Robert Altman would have done with the idea. And one of the things we kept, we were running across is that the film keeps being. She well, and this yeah. film were constantly compared to uh, Rob as a unfairly, as a unfairly like compared a failed to, to Robert Altman, Altman yeah. or um, an unsuccessful attempt at being Robert Altman, which I am honestly baffled by because other than it having a lot of like it having an ensemble cast where there's not a lot of there's not stars although I personally well, think Jeff an, Goldblum sort of steals yeah. every scene he's in but like he's not a big character right like they're all the same on the same level but like Altman has so much Altman has so much technical parts to the way he makes films, especially his sound design. And this film isn't like that at all. Yeah. It's not, it's not as audacious as Altman. And I think that it's very successful on that level. I mean, it is naturalistic, I guess, but independent film generally is it's yeah. sort of a byproduct of not having a lot of money. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I think it's off base, but at that point they thought it was fair. Maybe because she had an Oscar and, like I, not I, her, but the Oscar film. nomination. Yeah. I have no idea, but um, well, also because there are a lot of connections to Nashville and three women was also released in the same month. Uh, so there was a lot of Altman talk around the same mm. time. Okay. Um, that kind of stuff. That's how it works. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah. Um, in this uh, article that Bruce McCabe uh, wrote, there is a great, or the tell, tellingly, I think the person who speaks most, uh, speaks the best about the film is Laura Shapiro, who he refers to as the feminist columnist for the real paper, who says, I think the script maintains a high level of discourse, uh, higher than most movies in general. And one of the interesting things that I find about this movie is how much it speaks to the women in these relationships with creative men um, and the women 
They have agency. Who have voice. agency and voice and who are interested in their own careers and not just in supporting the careers of the men around them. In fact, they resent the fact that they are being asked to support the careers or of, and coddle the, the. They're not even asked, they're assumed. <laughs> assumed to be supporting them. I mean, I think that that's one of the things I liked the most about the film is that like the women, they ask why, like, well, why, why are you assuming I'm moving to New York? Even though that is what ends up happening, but they at least know that they have their own life and their own choice and they're making their own decisions for themselves. Um, which is, I, I mean, I, I think it's still rare. Yeah. You know, there is a scene that always sticks out to me that, that sort of shines out, which is when, uh, Harry John Hurd's character brings Abby, the Lindsay Krause character, to the strip club mm-hmm. to in, in, theoretically just to take pictures. But Lindsay Krause has like an uh, or Abby, the character, has an honest intellectual curiosity about the stripper who they're interviewing, played by Mary Lou Henner, mm-hmm. and begins to have this rapport. And and as a viewer, you can see that she's about to get the interview that anybody would want to read with this woman. And then and Harry's character insulted. gets insulted by this and is like, I'm the man. I'm the one who's here to do the interview. I'm the You're just here yeah. to take pictures, you know, back off instead of understanding that, um, that, that he should have taken a back seat and let the interview happen so that he could get a better perspective on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a scene that really stands out to me. And then, after that scene is over, Abby does stand up for herself and says, you should have let me have that conversation. You you spoiled it. You know, mm-hmm. I had the rapport and you were just asking dumb questions like everybody asks. Mm-hmm. Um, so those kinds of instances in this film, I and think- And it are doesn't what, ruin their relationship. No, it doesn't ruin they their- They still yeah. like- respect each other because there's that follow-up scene where she shows him the photos right. and they and um yeah. and i think that i i like that too that the male characters or some of the male characters do have sensitive delicate egos and are and the women do have to stand up for themselves and take up more space but they still get a base level of respect that is above just like being a skirt in the room, you know, especially for journalism movies can have a lot of misogyny in them all the way back to, you know, the forties. Sure. Um, And it's clear that, you know, the Max character, the Jeff Goldblum character, Max, the, the rock reviewer is a womanizer. He's playing, you know, he's, he's sleeping with all kinds of people and he's scamming drinks off of folks and, um, and you and know, giving lectures at Radcliffe, <laughs> giving lectures at Radcliffe, during which he gives out his phone number. Um, but uh, you know that's just part of the whole tapestry mm-hmm. that's that is represented. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that leads into one thing that we we wanted to talk about, which was sort of like who's who, what yeah. Boston is being, which Boston is being represented yeah. in the film. Yeah, and I think that in in the representation of Boston and what this city is, and really it's Boston, Cambridge and what the city is, is, is harder to get your finger on. Cause it's like, it's not a gangster movie like the departed or friends of Eddie Coyle. It's um, you know, it's not a Brahmin film like uh, the Thomas crown affair or, you know, some of the historic stuff like Bostonians or little women. Um and I think for me, that's one of the reasons why it feels authentic because it's it's actually following the people in Boston. So I, I definitely think it's it's focusing on the counterculture, anti-establishment community that you know, especially Harvard Square and Cambridge. I think point putting Harvard Square so visibly in there is intentional, um, and. The, the one of the moments in the fi- there are two moments in the film that I think are really telling for to go with that. So in the opening scene, when you're sort of you dive into the into Boston, basically through that helicopter shop shot and then you move into the hawker for the newspaper and he's hawking the newspaper to different cars and you're sort of introduced to these different 
types of people in Boston. And, you know, you're like, okay, so he's young and he's sort of like, he's a little inappropriate, but not in a creepy way. And, and then there's the scene with what I would say is a boss supposed to be a blue belt blood. The, the woman in the car who has, I can't remember if she has a hat on or just like a suit jacket. And, you know, he walks up and she just like rolls up her window and everyone else is talking to him. And he says, your daughter reads it. (laughs) Yeah. Then he says, your daughter reads. And then in the other person in the film that I feel like is representing the establishment per se is the, the ad sales guy at the paper who always is wearing a bow tie I almost I don't think I actually tried to note if they ever refer to him being a Harvard alum but I feel like he's sort of in there as supposed to be appointed like this is an Ivy school graduate you know doing this and he's so annoying to all these people and that sort of thing but at the same time the rest of the the cast, I do think, are working class, but educated. Some of them may even not be working class. They could be upper middle class, but they're not like bow tie wearing sort of, you know, they're really in the anti-establishment work. Um, I also think the other thing that I think is really interesting that they, that they grasp, that's a very big thing when you live in Boston in your 20s after undergrad, is this sort of brain drain if you're ambitious and the the people in this in the the characters in this cast are young and ambitious and also I will point out it's actually quite diverse like there are a lot of female characters there are people of color in the film you know there's not equity per se but just the fact that they're that they're showing that is great um but one of the things that you're constantly talking about in your 20s, right after you've graduated from college, say you either came to Boston or actually were in Boston for college, is this, um, where are you going to go next? Are you going to move to New York? Are you going to move to New York? Are you going to move to New York? And I thought it was interesting that some of the, like one of the characters, it was, or two of the characters, it was, are you going to go write your book? So it wasn't as much of a New York drain, although there were conversations about who's moving to New York, are you going to really move to New York? But just this idea that like, it's you're in transition. You're not rooted yet. Um, that I thought they really captured and is something I don't think it's true for a lot for every city, Yeah, you know, although the the, the transition of your twenties is true, but that like, this isn't where we're going to stay. We have yeah bigger ideas, bigger ideas. And, And the, the, the crux of the movie, I'm sure those of you who had a chance to watch the whole film uh, saw this is that they started, these people started, mostly people in the film started working for the paper when they were in college right. or at that just after college. And then they, this was the thing that they found that they wanted to do and they've worked at it as long as they can. And then with, you know, with the end of the war and the sort of like changes in the counterculture, they find themselves at a crossroads. What is, they've become, yeah they're on the cusp of becoming successful. Right. And so and establishment. And establishment. Mm-hmm. And so that there's this, there's mm-hmm. a uh there's a tension that they're having with their future. Yeah. And um, I think that that probably rang true as a truth in this in 77. Yeah, that that absolutely. that seems like they're capturing a moment that was really going on. Yeah. Um and understandably so. I don't remember that, but, <laughs> but, but I feel five, I, five years old. Uh, we didn't remember. I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> um, the other thing that I, that, that is, I think is important to point out is, and I mentioned it a little bit is that it's also Cambridge. So, and one of the reasons I think it's important to point out is because there, the scene, you know, I, I don't know if you guys experienced this, but when something's set in Boston, I can't help but try to figure out exactly where every single thing is that they're shooting. And this film, unlike most Boston films, is it pastiching these weird, like you really can sort of map out where they are, which is actually fun. Um, but the scene when they go to drive to the apartment, they're driving into Cambridge and it's clearly shot so that, you know, they're leaving, like, just like we drive it, you're leaving Boston going into Cambridge. 
Um, and a lot of it's actually set in Cambridge. And when I did research on the alternative newspapers in Boston, they actually predominantly were based in Cambridge too. So it's, uh, it's, um, it all makes sense in some ways. Although I do think that they're cheating to make you think that the office is in Boston. It's a little confusing about yeah. where the office is because it's clearly in Cambridgeport. Uh, and uh, we, at the end, I have some stills from the film and some pictures we'll, we'll go over that, but it's clearly in Cambridgeport and it is unclear why it's called the Back Bay Mainline right. when it's clearly in Cambridge to us. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter, yeah. to be honest. They do cheat a little bit in the like when Bruno Kirby's character is is cycling to South Boston and that would not be a, an easy or quick bike ride from Back Bay. No, no. <laughs> it would take some time. Um, but yeah. And then you looked into the yeah. sort of the alternative papers. Is there, thought... Before we jump into that though, I just wanted to find out, was there anything else that people caught about the way that Boston, like the Boston that's represented represented in this that is that stuck out to any of you i will let others speak but i do actually have a comment all right i'm going to go for it <laughs> although please raise your hand or just unmute yourself if you'd like to say something um i thought it was actually like really interesting like how authentic it felt like it really did feel very authentic um and i'm just sort of thinking about you know like how is boston portrayed in films uh, and today there's like, you know, there's this very clear sort of delineation that you have like Harvard, Ivy League, Brahmin depiction, you know, the social mm -hmm. network or pick your film. Um, and then there's the just the vast amount of crime films based in Boston, uh, which, you know, arguably starts with the Friends of Eddie Coyle. Uh, but then it's just, you know, countless you know, The Departed and all this stuff. Um, and this has nothing to do with either of those really. Right. Um, but it did look a lot more like what I remember Boston and Cambridge being like in the 70s and 80s, which was among other things, kind of grimy. Like, right. just, like not that well- Just like every well other city. <laughs> yeah, not that well maintained. Um, and, uh, and that really sort of um, felt very authentic in terms of how it actually looked. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that the point that you made about you just sort of mentioned in passing like the end of the war and the cost of these people becoming successful like this is actually like really uh it's a good prediction of what comes next which I don't know mm -hmm. if it was immediately clear in 77 mm. so you know Vietnam uh the last troops are taken out in 75 um so this is very soon after the end of the war um, but it's also like before the sort of mania of yuppie 1980s right. stuff, but it's really on that edge uh, between those two. Uh, and I think that it's really sort of reading that moment very well um, in terms of, uh, you know, it could have gotten it wrong, like it could have been totally wrong, but it was mm -hmm. very right in terms of how this actually played out. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought that that was very very interesting. And then just as a passing comment, I have to say, I'm really glad to know that uh, their office was actually in Cambridgeport because I kept looking at that and being like, that really looks a lot like Cambridge. <laughs> yeah. That really looks a lot like it. <laughs> but it said, you know, be, you know. Back Bay, Bay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I thought, I think I might live really close to that. Yeah. You do. You, you do. live very close uh, to that. Yeah. I, Ned will tell you I where. Do know, I do know where it is. Yeah, Ned did some, uh, the, some internet spying. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I think we can give them a pass on that because there are so often businesses that start in one place and then move their office somewhere else um, and that and keep this name as it moves around the city. So we've all I, seen it happen. I'm willing to give them a pass. We that. have a vet down the street. That's yeah. the Mount Auburn vet. And it's on um, uh, Beacon, Beacon Street, street in Somerville. In, in Somerville. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it, obviously, these the um, the Phoenix offices were in Boston. The uh, the newspapers were were all over the place, but the real paper was based in Cambridge, mm -hmm, right? You mm -hmm, you found that mm -hmm. out. Yeah. So we we got we have some great 
things coming in through the chat. So Anne was saying that she was actually a hawker for the Phoenix at the corner of Charles and Beacon. And she had that exact experience of a woman rolling her car window up on her. <laughs> um, so we know it's true. We've probably all done it to someone else too. Um, and then also pointing out the, the pre-gentrified Boston um, being portrayed. I like that your point about the, the blue transfer wear plates. So yes, they're blue willow, but they're the, they're not the antique ones. They're the cheaper ones. And that was some, I, I feel like the production design for that is really effective in that like in Boston, what you will find in an apartment is thrift store finds. Right. And so that's what the apartments are full of is like this hodgepodge of like 40s, 50s, 60s stuff um, that they would have gotten around. And I also do like the fact that the interior spaces, except for the club, and that's because we know it's actually a set that they shot in um, New York, although it looks exactly like the, the greenhouse mixed with what would the Kendall Cafe, um, that they feel very claustrophobic. They feel small, very intimate little apartments and like yeah. funny little doorways and, you know, sort of made up living spaces. So yeah, they definitely, the, the, uh, the, uh, the apartments feel very authentic. Yeah. And, and yes, on the subject of locations, it, it does, we are pretty sure that the whole nightclub scenes, all of their gathering together scenes that those were shot out of Boston. Mm -hmm. They were shot probably in New York City or maybe in New Jersey. I feel like I read something at some point that they might have done some shooting in New Jersey, but I was so um, sure the first time we saw it that it was the greenhouse because of the way the the plants in it, which was such a the greenhouse used to be a diner that was right in the center of Harvard Square. And one of the big things about it was that it had like this huge amount of plants inside. Yeah. Um, so I do think it was sort of inspired by that, even if. I'm actually not sure that the greenhouse existed at that, at time? that time. That's crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe we should transition into talking yeah. about the, the, um, the, <laughs> Uh, I was very mean look. waitresses. Wow. Yeah. yeah, they were epic. Um, so I don't know if anyone here worked for one of the alternative papers in Boston. And if you did, I would welcome you to speak up and and give us information. I will tell you, there's not a lot of information about them, I think, because they were alternative <laughs> is part of the reason. And that was all pre-internet. But um the history of alternative papers in Boston looks like it goes back to the mid 1800s. It's not like it's not a common thing, but there was a little um, bloom that happened around the, you know, the war efforts and the end of the war. Um, so there was a paper that I found called Avatar that published from 1967 to 1968. Um, and its first issue was published from the headquarters of this other paper that I could almost find nothing out about called Broadside. I found some covers um, and then the information that Broadside merged with Boston Free Press, not to be confused with BU's newspaper. And that ran from 1968 to 69. And they have these incredible psychedelic um, full color covers. Mm -hmm. They're really beautiful. Um, so yeah, so when the so the Boston Free Press ran from 68 to 69, and then Broadside and the Free Press, which is how it ran, was 69. And then we've talked about it a little bit, but there was the real paper, which was also based in Cambridge, Mass. And that was founded in 72. And it was a collective um, with employees owning equal shares. And it was actually a number of employees that had left the Cambridge Phoenix, which I didn't know was a thing, that was run by Mindich, Steve Mindich, and they had left because of him. And then sadly, slash ironically, in the late 70s, the real paper was struggling financially and was eventually stole, sold to Stephen Mindich, who, and then that was, and that was the Boston Phoenix. Um, the Boston Phoenix ran from 1966 to 2013. And, um, and then there's 
one, the Bay Windows is, is an alternative newspaper that's still printing today, started in 1983. It's a LGBTQ paper out of Back Bay. And there are two papers. One is less alternative than the other, but Boston Compass, which started publishing in 2010 um, and is still publishing today, I believe. I mean, with COVID, it's hard uh, they, to know. They've, they've are gone they online. online. Both, both. So the other paper she was talking about is Dig Boston, otherwise known as the Weekly Dig, which was founded in 1999. Both of those papers have been sort of on and off being only online or printed um, because of the impact of, uh, of COVID. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of the alternative and uh, uh, underground press has touched upon uh, I think in, in Ryan Walsh's book, um, oh, yeah. uh, about, uh, about astral weeks, which is a great read. If you want to read about sort of the secret, the, the overlooked history of uh, weirdo Boston in the late sixties, um, which of course I do. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to try sharing my screen. So this right here is uh, is the original ad. Obviously, starts today. The New England premiere of Between the Lines at the Sherry, uh, one of my favorite old theaters. And if you take it, I'll leave it up for a minute so you can read a few of the pull quotes from papers outside of Boston uh, <laughs> that that uh, talk about it favorably. Um, uh, I mean, Janet Maslin, who was writing for Newsweek at the time. Uh, compares it favorably compares it to American graffiti and the cast is del is a delight. It's um, interesting. Yeah. That they use gold Jeff Goldblum as the like one image. For yeah. Them. I mean, Gold Goldblum in all of the reviews, Goldblum is, is really the highlight for a lot of people. But was and, it, wasn't it one of the, one of the reviews that said he may, he may be, he, he may become an actor. Yeah. He may even become an actor or something like that. I was like, if he's in a movie, isn't he an actor? Yeah. Anyways, getting into the um, to the location. So I just have a few shots of when they're on the sort of like car, car chase trying to uh, catch up with David uh, before he gets beaten up. So obviously we're on Storo Drive heading into Boston. And then uh, the uh, late lamented James Hook um crossing into south boston crossing into fort point area which is this is the sort of like this is absolutely unrecognizable uh from today obviously uh fort point is like a whole other city now um so this is also that same scene um then one of my favorite uh locations at charles street station mgh station which was uh where i i grew up on beacon hill so this was my subway stop and a, a red line train not being red uh i thought was interesting uh from that time of course cheapo records this is in cheapo's original location which i think um is where the uh science fantasy bookstore is now pandemonium i think it's so right, right near the post office yeah near the okay. post office around the, the corner from street. the can tab uh, and then they did actually, I was curious whether this was shot in Times Square or in uh, the combat zone. And it, it is the combat zone. This is the marquee for the Pilgrim Theater. Um, you can tell by seeing a little bit of its, uh, its distinctive pink neon there. Uh, and this is what it looked like in its heyday, thanks to a, an image from the globe. And this is what it looks like today. What's well, great? Uh, so glad there's a big parking garage there. Um, uh, thanks to Google for my street views. Um, this is one of my favorite little detective jobs that I did. I I saw this shot and I was like, "Where is he in this phone booth? And what is that thing? What does that awning say behind him? Does it say Galway House? Right. I thought that makes that, sense. Yeah. You know, maybe you know it's the Galway House. Maybe they were shooting in JP. That didn't doesn't make any sense." And uh, at one point he moves his head and you can kind of see that it says florist on the sign above. Uh, so I found the Galgay florist. Galgay the florist. Galgay the florist at 757 Mass Ave, which is 
uh, across the street from the Central Square Post Office, where thirteen next door to thirteen sixty nine. So and Cheapo was there too. So they clearly had a little yeah. So they spot shot. Where they shot one day right there. around one day mm-hmm. right around there. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, and this is okay. So this is Harry's house, which I always thought it looked very familiar to me. Um, and this is sort of a view down the road, but it, it, it I couldn't really place it. Uh, I found this image today. I drive by this building all the time. It's on Beacon Street in Somerville, uh, right next door to the Walgreens. And across from Whole Foods. And across from Whole Foods. Uh, So I'm pretty sure that's I love that the building looks exactly the same. The building looks pretty much the same. Um, Of course, here's uh, here's part of the Harvard Square shot. Uh, That... The building on the left side of the frame is the greenhouse building, but it's something it's kitchen, something kitchen. Yeah. And I just don't, I, I don't have that, that memory. Um, if somebody in the chat is sharing, I will, I will look, this is the, uh, this is the, obviously the, the middle, this is really like with that Copley square shot at the beginning, this is like the other just great placemaking, placemaking yeah. <clears throat> Harvard square, of course, they have no reason to be. This is nowhere near where the offices are compared to where Cheapo is, but still they had to have a shot in Harvard Square because don't forget, this is post Love Story, which is what, 1970. This is post the paper chase. So there is like this, you know, Good point, between yeah. the lines does kind of exist in a sort of Boston. It's world. not a genre technically, <clears throat> but it's sort of a milieu of these like real people live pseudo in romantic comedies. Yeah. Um, all right. So here's here is the Back Bay Mainline building from the film. Uh, from the film, this is the first establishing shot. This is you can see the front of the building um, with. Uh, I know. I was thinking maybe it was the Masseys. You know. No, oh be- yeah. Only no. because it's a corner. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't think of another corner spot like that. So I pulled a bunch of these shots. This is um, looking. So it's basically it's at the intersection of a two way street and a one way street. This is looking down the two way street. Uh, this is when there's a car accident towards the end of the movie. And you can see the whole intersection. This is the building. So it's 263. Um, I forget is it Putnam? But it's, it's, Putnam. A, it's a gallery. It's at the corner of Putnam yeah, and Pearl Street. 263 Gallery is the name of the business that's there now. And I believe it's apartments upstairs. Um, yeah. So that that is uh that is what you what we're looking at in these other shots. Uh yeah. So so, so yes, uh, Gavin, you live you live right you're nearby. Very, you're very we're all very close. Yeah, like blocks yeah yeah Yeah. but yeah as you can see it makes no sense for them to walk through harvard square if you're going from the corner of uh pearl and putnam to uh to cheapo in central square but yeah no harvard square is it on the way it's movie magic those things happen all the time in movies um what have we missed in the chat uh yeah of course gavin spied nini's corner um and yes the uh out of town news had that separate separate building from the uh from the entrance mm. yeah the um the building that people commonly associate with with out of town news uh used to be the head house to uh go down into the uh to the mbta station um which was most famous because at least in my mind uh because they had these creepy escalators that had wooden slats that folded in together <gasps> and it was incredibly narrow it was like one person wide um, and so if you were a kid in the seventies, this looked like death. <laughs> this looked like absolutely <laughs> like, like it was just going to grab you and pull it down. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Um, but yeah. And then, um, not to get too deeply into this, but, uh, when the red line was extended, uh, out to Airwife, which the Airwife state station opened in 85 and, the uh, Porter Davis, uh, stations opened in 84, um, they mm-hmm. actually picked up the building and they moved it and stored it. Uh, and then that whole center was just a giant pit, uh, and they did all the excavation and and ran the the line up, and then they brought it back and they um, gave it to uh, Out of Town News, uh, who opened it. So then there was the new the new station that we see today, um, and the Out of Town News essentially moved it under the lot that they were on. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> there is some great, uh, you know, if nobody has seen them, there's great images online of uh, the pit 
uh, not the pit uh, where everybody, where Gavin and I used to hang out when we were teenagers, but uh, the actual like hole in the ground that was dug in that area when they were extending the red line. Mm -hmm. It's pretty incredible to see the extent of that um, excavation that was done um, and how it's all exposed to the air. But uh, that's pretty much the end of what we uh, had planned on talking about. Um, you've seen it all. You now know all the secrets of the locations of uh, of um, between the lines. If anybody knows where the actual uh, location that uh, Bruno Kirby's David gets beaten up at, uh, let, let me know. But it's some no longer existing vacant lot in uh, in Fort Point slash Seaport slash South Boston <laughs> slash maybe the waterfront. Um, but, uh, yeah. yeah. So, that is it. Uh, I would encourage if people have any comments or, or questions, feel free to raise their hands. Um, but, uh, I thought, you know, it was a, a great sort of trip down memory lane. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that's the, I guess to, to wrap up one of the things that Ivy and I, as people who show movies all the time really value about films from other decades is the idea that they are uh, a part of history as well as a snapshot of history. And this film is just one of those great examples of a movie that feels so authentically of its time and can really show us what things looked like and how it felt, particularly if you watch it for a second time, or as I have third, time um so that you can kind of look beyond the characters who are in the front of the screen and start looking at the people walking by uh in the frame or the people who are just sort of incidental to it when even when i was taking these screen grabs i started noticing things like <clears throat> there are people leaning out the windows of apartment buildings um watching them in that car accident scene there's a guy with his kid on his shoulders, who's clearly just like walked out of his house and been like, what, what is going on here? You know? And so like those kinds of things that you can see when you're, when, after you've already experienced the movie mm -hmm. and you can go back and, and look at it as a, as a time capsule, yeah. as a historical document. Yeah. I sort of talk about them like they're time travel movies, like not every film that's shot in its time or is a period piece does this but there are these films where you really feel like you've seen something about another time um that feels authentic and like you were sort of carried back in time in a way that doesn't always happen i see that john has asked in the comments what can what can be said about the tension between alternative rags and the main mainstream mainline press over the years um i mean i don't I don't have a lot of experience other than the obvious, which is that, you know, the underground press were the places where people were really given a full voice yeah. to speak. And a lot of the time, uh, people who were not from the mainstream um, were able to, to speak in those, in those um, venues that where they weren't given a voice in the mainstream press. And I feel like the, I mean, at least with our experience working with the Phoenix and the globe, which like running the brattle, that was our main thing is that, you know, the, the Phoenix staff really pri prided themselves on covering more than just the obvious thing. Like that, that's how it felt to me, like that they were doing the work to actually look at what should be covered or what they wanted to be covered while the mainstream press is really covering a lot of what, is like driven by ads that that I feel like that was always one of the big not that the not that all the alternative press isn't driven we're, by ads as you're getting into danger film, dangerous but, territory but, but I think I, but like especially with movies like the studio films get more coverage in the main or used to no one gets coverage anymore in the mainstream papers because there's a whole um ecosystem thank you that's the word I was looking a for. financial ecosystem yeah. but but also it's not you know, we did find, honestly, in all of our dealings with all of the press in uh, in Boston, from when we took over to today, that there was a real dedication in covering uh, what was important. Yeah. And that I think the thing about the underground press um, is that being, you know, as the as the names imply, 
the Globe and the Herald and the papers that papers of record are at a, operate at a much higher level, and they aren't always able to see those things that are starting to be in, become important in the underground mm-hmm. that are starting to be represented by the counterculture that then become covered by those uh, higher up papers, you know, five years later or six months later or whatever. Yeah. It's the underground papers that were a lot of the time breaking news. And also the, I know at least one critic that went all the way from the real paper to is still writing today. And one of the things that he said to me is that he was able to actually develop his own voice by working in at the alternative media versus, you know, there, at least when there were more film pieces being put up there, there is a formula to how you're supposed to cover all of the, the elements to it. And I think that that's, I think that that's really interesting. Um, so yes, you've exhausted our ability to talk about as uh, non as non mainstream versus underground press. We oh. can talk about it in terms of movies. Yeah, anybody want to talk about movies? We can do that. <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm realizing we're coming uh, to the end of the hour, uh, so um, I want to thank you. I want to just make one other comment though, which is, um, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but my impression is that there was nobody in the movie who had like a, a exaggerated Boston accent. I yes. So actually, I feel like one of the only people who did have a Boston accent. Well, there was the 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 two gangsters um, and then and I wish I'd looked up the name of the actor's name because he's an actor, but the the African-American um, staff person. Joe Morton. Yeah. Yeah. He had. I felt like what sounded like, but they didn't try, which I thought was really no, wonderful. That, that was, and, and I, and, <laughs> and it's true. Like not everybody is from Boston who right. lives here. And, you know, I'll also say that one of the, as I guess as a final note about the film's production, one of the things that I read about the casting process were that was that the people were cast for who they were mm-hmm. and that like Lindsay Krauss wanted to have a backstory and make her, you know, make her character more of a working class person and and maybe give her more of a Boston accent or something like that. And the word from uh, from Silver was, I you've been cast for like who you are and, and the feeling that we got from you mm. so that these characters should be more, should be closer to who you are and what your personality is rather than trying to like bring a lot of actory stuff. Hence why Jeff it. Goldblum was so Jeff Goldblum. Yeah, so Goldblum, no. <laughs> Anyways, there you go, everybody. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks to everyone who, who joined us. Um, and we're going to take a little bit of a hiatus for the film club in, in August, but we'll be back in September. So I hope you can join us then. And uh, in the meantime, while we're not having film club, you should go to the Brattle Theater. <laughs> yeah. Please do. Okay. Have we'll a great evening, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.